forever. <laughs> Dog. Welcome to another episode of Best Show Bests, the greatest hits of the best show with me, your host, Tom Sharpling. If you like what you hear, make sure you join us every Tuesday night on Twitch at 6 p.m. Pacific for a brand new episode of the best show featuring callers, celebrity guests, live music, and plenty of surprises. Enjoy! Is this it? Oh my goodness. Nervous now. Hold on. Uh, WFMU, uh, you're on the air? Uh, this is Martin Short here. Oh my goodness. Oh my god, my name's Tom. How are you, uh, Mr. Hey, Short? Hey Tom, how are you? I'm doing okay. Uh, this is an honor to have you call the program, first well, of all. Well, thank you very much. I wanted to It's say. an honor for you to uh, exaggerate your emotions to me, so thank you. It is, this is not an exaggeration. I'm all sweaty. <laughs> I'm starting to get sweaty. I'm be sweaty. I'm going to try not to get sweaty. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for calling up. Yeah. You, uh, I should let everybody know you uh, will be doing a show this Saturday in Red Bank, New Jersey, at the uh, Count Basie Theater. The very hip Count Basie Theater. Yes. And the name of the show is... Uh, if if I'd, I'd saved, I wouldn't be here. Yes. And that, uh, that's this uh, Saturday night. People can go to uh, countbasietheater.org to find out more about that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I can say this. I've had comedians come, and, come on the show. You know, you do it once you're good. You do it twice, you're great. You have done it so many times for so many years. You are a legend and uh, we all are all in awe of you. I've gotten so many responses from uh, the idea of you appearing on the show. People didn't believe that it was going to happen. <laughs> well, that's very nice. Um, uh, you know, your old buddy Andy Beckman yes. uh, contacted me and of course you know he's a genius. Yes, he is. And uh, we did Saturday Night Live together back uh, like in 84, 85 season. Yeah, that's right. And you... he, was, he was the funniest guy in the, on the staff. There was, he, was a, he was the go-to guy. The guy, if you had an idea and you now were convinced that it was bad, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. he would tell you, no, it's not bad. You know, <laughs> he still had that, um, that uh, rhythm of his back then, you know. Yeah, the... Uh... Anyway, he phoned me and said, uh, I should do your show. So I, of course, said yes, sir, and responded. Well, thank you. I appreciate you listening to Andy and uh, doing it. I guess, uh, I, let me just first tell people about it. Can you tell people about your show, the, the, uh, the show that they can see this uh, Saturday night, to give them an idea of what's in store for them? Uh, I would say it's a, it's a very loose uh, show. It's kind of a lot of improv. It's, you know, it's... Uh, uh, there'll be a hip band. I'll be singing and dancing and doing all that stuff, and uh, and then take everyone through a fake journey of my life. Uh, and Jimmy Glick will show up, and Ed Grimley will show up, and you know, uh, Frank will show up, you know. And uh, you know, when I go into the audience, I bring people up. It's 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 uh, it's a party with Marty. I, that's what I call it. Uh, uh, uh. Well, that's exciting. That's awesome. I can't wait. I'm going to be there. I know I'm. Well, I'm, that's very cool. That's it. Now, uh, as far as you doing uh, you doing impressions, you do characters, and you've done throughout your career impressions. Well, like for, for you, where, like where, what do you prefer? Do you prefer inventing a character or trying to crack the code on somebody and do an impression of them? You know, I never really thought of doing it, but you know, when I was doing SCTV, we would just come up with an idea, and then we'd take a tape home, and then you do an impression, but you do it, and then you do it as, and the second that like you'd filmed it you did, couldn't do it anymore mm -hmm. you know someone would say oh I have an idea that Gore Vidal, and one time Gore Vidal and Norman Mailer got into a fight at a party yeah huh. so Eugene Levy and I turned that into a Tide commercial mm -hmm. and so now Eugene's studying Norman Mailer tapes and he's never done him and I'm studying Gore Vidal and I'm doing him and you get the angle right and what I used to do is take the script that we'd write and then I'd take a transcription of an interview with Gore Vidal, and you realize when you look at someone's transcription that that it's the pauses and the ahs and the and the repetition of the phrases, you know, become. So what you do is you lift those out and put it into your script, and suddenly you get the rhythm of the guy you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. 
But it wasn't necessarily like I was this, you know, impressionist. Sure. As far as characters, I was just, I, I wasn't mimic. Even as a kid, I could, you know, impersonate the teachers and or the guy in the street, you know. And, and suddenly, these voices uh, became... Because everyone's a character, you know. You pick up your shirts, and the lunatic who's saying "Don't get that dirty," you know, is a real guy, and he's worn that shirt for a reason. And if you try to present that, let's say, to uh, even a, on Saturday Night Live or in a film, they might say, "Oh, that's too broad." But the reality is that guy's wearing that shirt, and that's the way he talks. Yeah, he's actually so you just out have there. to kind of, He's actually out there. So you just have to be kind of sincere in the. In- in, in 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 what you're doing, and then you can go kind of as broad as you want. Mm-hmm. Is there is there ever a person you could not crack like that? Is there a person you where you could not do like where you where you could not find the way in where, either to interpret them as a character? You know, somebody who I, I think I think you know. It's why people gravitate toward Chris Walken or Jack Nicholson or Marlon Brando because they're distinctive voices. You know, Johnny Carson was someone no one ever could do. Mm-hmm. Or uh, Dana Carvey actually figured out a way to do it. It was kind of brilliant. But um, obviously, the, the way to get in, you know, you hear the voice, you place the voice, and figure out what the tone is. But mainly the attitude. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, Chevy Chase was hilarious back in the seventies doing Gerald Ford, and he didn't do any makeup. No, he just just c- captured some something that was stupid that was funny. You know. Sure. Uh, this is very. We have uh, Martin Short on the on the uh, show right now. He, uh, you can see him uh, this Saturday at the Count Basie Theater in Red Bank, New Jersey. The show's called "If I'd Saved, I Wouldn't Be Here," and you can find out more about it, CountBasieTheater dot org. Now, uh, Mr. Short, I can can I call you Marty, please? I wish you would. Oh, jeepers! Oh, I'm gonna faint, Mike. <laughs> so, Marty. Yes. I don't know if you uh, are aware. Well, of how this. presumptuous. Yeah, <laughs> you uh, you've done so many things in your career: the SCTV, the Saturday Night Live, the Three Amigos, your talk show. But there's one thing in my in my life that you've done that, uh, and there's this there's this growing movement behind it now. It's something that uh, it's a movie called Clifford. That I love did. Clifford. <laughs> Which that? Why? Thank you. That is. I'm going to say top five favorite movies of all time. I've seen it uh, a dozen. I've seen it easily a dozen times. Oh, well, thank you. And I, I actually went as far. I bought on eBay one of your outfits from Clifford. <laughs> well, that's see. Now we're getting into an illness. Yes, it, well, it is. Now I'm that. sweating. It's a fun illness, though. It's a good, very fun. Illness. I can't wait till you come to Red Bank. I'll be wearing it. Good. I, I, I cannot. Fantastic. With the red jacket? It's the uh, dinner scene uh, out, uh, outfit. <laughs> and I have the so shoes you, and everything. So you're a slight little thing. No, I'm not. I'm I'm six foot three here. But I can't. You, what, did you cut the back? No, I've never worn it. I just... Oh, I see. It's in a box. I don't know what oh, to I do with it. I got so excited, wow. I bought it, and then I just said, I don't know what to do with this now. <laughs> but... Can you, you know, everybody knows about SCTV, but Clifford is wildly underdocumented. It is underdocumented. It was a bizarre, uh, bizarre film that um, Orion made, Orion Studios, and then in the middle of shooting it, they went bankrupt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then they went bankrupt. And we thought, well, that's a bad omen. And so it, it kind of opened and, and, and went away. But then. In video, and it became this kind of cult thing, and then college campuses got into it, and um, and uh, so people talk to me about that film more than a lot of things. It's amazing, no, I, but I I love that movie. I think that's one of the truly odd films <laughs> that just the conceit that a that a forty year old man would play a ten year old, and I was very obsessive that he wasn't thirteen; he was ten. Uh-huh. Yeah. So that his obsession with with uh, Mary Steenburgen was in fact um, almost prepubescent. Yes, and it was even though I was forty when I made it. <laughs> it almost made it like religious. The, his yes, obsession exactly. with it. it yes, in the in the stare. Now, home. Yeah. Now, how did the did, did that start as something for you, or did that start as something for a kid? Like, what what was the process 
with Clifford? No, uh, the the uh, the the guy who conceived it and it was Stephen Campman, and he was and is a friend of mine, and he uh, his idea was to uh, cast me in it, and I thought it was insane, and he convinced me. And then we did a screen test, and the screen test was funny, mm-hmm. um, and you kind of. You know, it is a weird journey when you talk about heightened films or bizarre films. I remember when we were doing, um, we were promoting Three Amigos, and Steve Martin and Chev Jason and I went on Today Show. And Brian Gumbel kind of, you know, in a kind of patronizing way said, well, what do you guys say if people just say this film is silly? And I remember Steve Martin said, well, it depends how you say the word silly. Mm -hmm. If you say it's silly, then I say thank you if you say it's silly, then I guess it's a drag. So, so, and then what ultimately happened, that was 1986, and then through the years, a lot of films became, quote-unquote, silly, like Three Amigos, and, um, and the singing bush and all the heightened stuff. And, and, and in a way, Clifford did that, too. Mm-hmm. Now, when, uh, in, in Clifford, when you, uh, how loose? How loose were you playing the character versus the the script for it? Were you guys you and were you and Charles Grodin in Clifford? That two man, when you guys are at when you're sitting down at that table, and he's yelling at you. I mean, that's no. Just, he, there's a lot of stuff in there that that's um, in the moment. When he screams, I mean, you know, he's a brilliant improvis- improviser, and he um, and loves to stay, keep it very loose. So when mm-hmm. uh, the, when he's screaming, he's saying, "Look at me like a human boy," you know that. And uh, that was all. You know, there were lots of things that were not uh, planned, shall we say. Yeah. Well, that, that um, you know, that, that movie, I'm speechless just even that I'm finally getting answers to Clifford. What were, how did you do the, the, uh, the height adjustments on it? Were, there, were you, like when you were doing like your dancing, was there like a little trench that you were in? Or like were you no, were there, no, there weren't the trenches because uh, we didn't have that big a budget, you know, so you'd have to be in a the house. There were, there were times when... when um, I'd be walking along in a close-up, and then we'd cut to, um, you know, the the back shot of me walking away with uh, Charles Gordon, and we'd slip in a little kid, you mm-hmm. know, for that. Uh, or we, but mainly we got extras that were six foot three. That was all the requirement. So, <laughs> so when I'm dancing with the girls, they're all six three. Okay. Basketball gals. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And do you know where the uh, where the little dinosaur is now? Do you have him? Uh, Stefan. Yes, yeah, I have Stefan. In a trophy case? I have Stefan, uh, well, not a trophy case, but he's certainly in a drawer somewhere, you know. Okay. Uh, with <laughs> really? Just a drawer? With, well, he's just in a drawer. He's not uh, behind glass. You know, he's, he's Stefan from Clifford. But, um, uh, you know, shoved with uh, an old Amigo hat or something. It's mm-hmm. in a case. Yes. Now, uh, just one, one uh, a couple more things here. I don't know how, look, I don't know how much time you have. I... I'm driving, so you're you're whatever you need. Okay, I'm just here, and I'm here as long as you can stay until wow. you're, when you're like fed a up. Telephone. We're doing a telephone yeah. now. When you're fed up, you say, "I'm going to go now." You just say, "Well, that was that was long ago, so oh. I passed that moment, and I keep moving forward." Oh well, thank you for being a, a trooper here. Uh, thank you so much. Um. You know, one thing one thing uh, I have noticed g- going through your uh, your uh, your body of work is that uh, you don't operate from a sense of uh, meanness with with your stuff, or or a sense of being like overly profane. You know, you you definitely have like every there's such a good spirit to everything you you've, you've uh, kind of put out there, all your characters. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't think uh, you know, I in my life, I'm kind of happy. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm kind of, you know, laughing in the inside, too. So I'm, I'm, I, there's no axe to grind. So um, to me, I guess, probably uh, something that runs through my stuff is, is, is celebrating bizarre and grotesque people. Mm-hmm. But um, not, uh, I'm not angry at anything or howling at the moon, you know. Sure. sure. Even Jimmy Glick is kind of a... Um, uh, it was not, you know, I've been asked if that's my attempt to get back at the media. Well, I never had a problem with the media. They've always been very nice to me, actually. So Jim Glick was just a moron with power. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you flip around. I mean, he was an offshoot of my TV show, but if I had just been creating that character in a vacuum, he probably would have been a politician. You know, the idea that people like 
George Bush became president is hysterical to me in a way. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and the panic that he must have felt midday, you know. And uh, so I, and, or you flip around talk shows and, or, or afternoon TV shows and you see these people are huge hits and you realize they must have a staff that's nervous when they're coming in the room and someone's getting their, their, their tuna sandwich. And these guys are complete goofs and they shouldn't have any position at all. <laughs> and so that always makes me laugh. Yeah, that, that's great. Now, now, Jiminy Glick came out of the, the, uh, the talk show, the daily. The, the, the right. I, I, was, I was doing a show at CBS, and uh, Martin Short Talk Show, and I wanted to, we were at the Farmer's Market in Los Angeles, and I wanted to go uh, into Farmer's Market and do um, incognito, uh, you know, we, so we could get pieces, second unit pieces. And what happened was, and I'd now been doing all this stuff, putting on putty noses long enough so that people would just, I'd be in two hours makeup. Mm-hmm. And people would come up and say, hey, can I have your autograph? And I'd say, well, this is a drag. And so, but I'd made this movie Pure Luck, where at one point I'm stung with a bee, and my face is supposed to swell up. And when I was shooting that day in that movie, everyone said, boy, I can't see you in there. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, that's what we should do. We should make them look like that moment. And... um and then there was a guy on my street when I was growing up in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, and who, whose voice went high and then very low. You know, he was, uh, he, if, you, if you stayed off his lawn, he owned a movie theater, and, he, and if you stayed off his lawn for an entire year, uh, he'd let you go to the movie theater for free. So I thought, well, that's a great voice, and I just kind of, you know, put it away for a few decades. And then you, uh, you, found, you found the voice to fit the... The character, right. no rush. Oh, look, yeah, look. I don't. However, it worked. It worked. Yeah, That's yeah exactly. Well, you did it the right way. Yeah, but but anyway. So so uh, yeah, that was it. But but uh, yeah, no, I don't think um I don't think that there's uh and, and you know swearing. You know, I remember when I was starting Second City in Toronto. Joe Flaherty was the director of the stage show I was doing, and he said, you know, you'll always uh. You'll always get a laugh if you mind putting on your pants and hitting your foot and swearing. And that will always be a laugh. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you can do better than that. So that always stayed with me. Mm-hmm. Now, now going, you mentioned Joe Flaherty. When you were, you were, uh, you were in addition to the, uh, was it the final season of SCTV on NBC? Um, no, the second to last the season. Second, okay. there were, I, I came in the middle okay. of the, see, whatever you call that season before the last season. Mm-hmm. And then we did a cin- Cinemax season. Yes. Now, how, right. how, how, how scary was that for you? Like, I mean, even though you knew these guys off, you, know, you had worked with these guys in the theater and you had relationships with a lot of those guys. But It was daunting. It was daunting because, uh, you know, the show was already a massive, that weird thing of it being a hit and a critical hit, and it just won all these Emmys. But I think that I did have a long, long history with these people. Mm-hmm. Andrea Martin is my sister-in-law. Sure. Uh, I went to university with Eugene Levy and Dave Thomas. Joe I'd known since, you know, 10 years before that. Mm-hmm. Catherine O'Hara I met when she was 17. Mm-hmm. So, so it wasn't like... So what I kind of did was... Um, I actually did it very smartly. I really... I thought, okay, if I'm going to do this show and jump into this, I've got to, I'm going to um, ask and, and expect a lot of help here. So when we shoot the pieces, you know, I bring Joe and Eugene into the editing room. Okay, what do we do here? What do you think here? What do you think that? And it was a great process because, um, you know, it wasn't live. So uh, the, the sensibility, the comedic sensibility became the people creating the show. And so there was no, pro- you know, the thing about Saturday Night Live is you're going to have a great idea. But if the audience doesn't laugh at it, you, you feel like a failure, and the, the producers kind of say, well, I guess we've got to cut that, you know, because they go into mm-hmm. to the sh- dress around three shows heavy, uh, three scenes heavy. Mm-hmm. And so you, you, um, you kind of go, uh, so you tend to have things that are out there and big and with jokes, and, but the subtlety that you could um, create on uh, SCTV was having no audience was an advantage. Sure. There's like a. It seems like the difference between movies and theater. In a way, yes, I think that's true. And um, both were both were exhilarating, by the way. I was, you know, I had a, was one of the few who um, uh, was able to do both shows, and uh, they were equally 
exhilarating and equally had a an advantage built into their makeup. Mm-hmm. You know. Let me just say, we have uh, Martin Short on the show now, and uh, if uh, you are in the New Jersey area, which a lot of you are, he has a, he will be appearing at the Count Basie Theater this Saturday night, uh, May 2nd, in Red Bank, New Jersey. The, sh- the name of the show is If I'd Saved, I Wouldn't Be Here, and you can uh, get uh, tickets and more information uh, on that going to uh, CountBasieTheater.org. Now, um... Just talking about SCTV, you uh, what? Well, do you remember the first time you felt like that you scored, like in that in that environment? You were like, man, that's what I need to do. Um, I I, I think that yeah, you know, I remember the first read through. Uh, also, my brother Michael worked on the show, so the first thing we did when I joined the cast is he and I went to his house and we wrote two scenes, and both of them got on. Mm-hmm. One was uh, Jerry Lewis live at the Champs Elysees, and sure. one was this uh, uh, photographer Ron Galella satire of him. And even the cast members are saying, "Well, you know what? That, that's that's very, uh, you know." But everyone was really, really in my camp. There was no kind of who's this guy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I had done Second City for two years with most of the cast on stage. So it was a likely, and also at that point, um, uh, Dave and Rick were going, uh, Dave Thomas and Rick Rannis were planning to leave. So they needed me to work out as much as I wanted to, it to work out for me. Sure. So I don't, I don't remember that moment of being like panicked and then suddenly saying, I can do it. I don't think, first of all, I never feel I can do it. Mm-hmm. You know, I always think that I'm just faking it and that um, each th- new thing will not work. So there's never that moment. But I never felt um, isolated and, you know, pretending. I remember when I did Three Amigos, I didn't know Steve Martin or Chevy Chase or John Landis or Lorne Michaels or Randy Newman who had written the music and part of the script. And so that was a daunting thing to be thrown into, especially because you were supposed to be one of the Amigos. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I remember certainly for a couple of weeks there doing an impersonation of myself being relaxed. (laughs) Uh Uh, And and then... um, kind of then relaxed into it sooner than I'd expected. Mm-hmm. And I guess uh, uh, that's, uh, that's a, look, they, they, like you said, but the thing is, you're coming to this thing, you could never say this, you're you! These Again, they're, they're glad to have you there, too. You didn't win a, a lottery to get there. You bring No, the but it is, there's, a, there's a weird advantage to being loose, you mm-hmm. know? Uh, and confidence is amazing. It's like uh, when you talk about doing talk shows or stuff like that. I remember, um, uh, you know, Ed McMahon saying to me that, uh, you know, he, he, it was, they had just finished the run of The Tonight Show. And he said, Johnny Carson said to him, uh, you know, they were about to go on, and then Johnny turned and said, Hey, Ed, do you remember, we're all legends tonight. Remember when they hated us that first two years? <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. And... Uh, when you just are on, when you just are in the job, I guess I say to my kids now, too, when they start a new job, you know, whatever you think it is right now, if you don't like it, it will be fine in a few months. It mm-hmm. just, you know, you relax into it. And so there is an event, but unfortunately with a movie, you don't have time to relax into it because if you wait a couple of months, it's already finished shooting. So, um, but anyway, it was, yeah, no, they, they, they were fun. They were funny guys. Steve uh, is hilarious. He once phoned me up and said, uh, when Divine, the performance artist, died, he phoned mm-hmm. me up and said, I, I, I feel badly for Divine, but the good news is more roles for us. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. And uh, so it was, it was and, and Chevy's really funny. It was, it was fun doing that. Now, uh, now uh, just one, one more thing about SCTV. Do you, is there anything, when you think about those days, is there one defining memory that you've got? That you that is kind of always the first thing that pops in your mind of that time. Um, I think I think I, I just I think that we worked so long. You know, there was no if there were unions, they weren't operating because I just remember Joe Flaherty and I would shoot for some reason. I think of Joe particularly. We'd shoot till around eleven in the mor- eleven at night, and then. 
we'd frantically try to find last call in a bar somewhere because we'd have to be back at 6 in the morning. And so you lived in that bubble of shooting and, and editing. And then I remember um, James Wolcott in, in New York Magazine at that time wrote this kind of amazing piece on the show, and, and he was very kind to me. And I remember on a subway going to work looking at him saying, hey, someone's watching the show. This is cool, you know. Mm-hmm. And that was that was a defining moment. And then, of course, you know, we would get nominated for all these Emmys, and we'd get nominated for every writing Emmy category. You know, I mean, like every option. Uh, what am I trying to say? Every every category in the thing we'd get nominated for. So you'd go to Hollywood, and suddenly you, people that you had actually impersonated were coming up and saying how much they liked the show. So all that stuff was weird because shooting it in Toronto and shooting so many hours and shooting it with no interference from a network, really. Uh, and and shooting your own sensibility, you really felt like you were uh, in this little bubble, doing your own little thing, a little you know, carving your craft, your wood carving, you know, in, in a um, in a little hut in Montana, and suddenly people are writing about you. Mm-hmm. Now, would you be willing, Mr. Martin Short, Marty? Sorry, would yeah. you to take a couple phone calls? Absolutely. Okay. If anybody has any questions for Mar- you, call him Martin. By the way, callers. I call him Marty. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the difference in our relationship. Exactly. We have we have gotten to this part. The number is 201-209-9368. If you have a question for uh, for Martin Short, who will be appearing, I can say, in uh, this Saturday, May 2nd, in Red Bank, New Jersey, at the uh, Count Basie Theater. The name of the show is If I'd Saved, I Wouldn't Be Here. And it's uh, countbasietheater.org. Uh, you can find out more about that um mike is uh, screening calls right now um we actually somebody just sent a question online they wanted to know what like what what does a martin short turn to today for for laughs like who who do you admire that's that's uh you know the the current up-and-comers oh I, i'm a very easy laugh i can i can i laugh at a lot of people i think uh I think Seth Rogen's hysterical. I think Kristen Wiig is a genius. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that um, you know, I kind of look at the 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 earnest commitment to character work as always. I'm a little seduced by, mm-hmm. you know, or just kind of again, uh, a kind of a fresh looseness. I think is is or funny situations. I don't know. I, I I've never been a tough laugh. Okay. Well. Here we have a couple calls here. What's good here, Mike? Okay, they're all good. How about that? <laughs> that is that FMU, you're on the air. Hi, this is Lee from Wisconsin. Can you hear this guy, uh, Marty? I sure can. Hey, Mr. Short, I'm a big fan, okay? <laughs> but I uh, I got to ask a question. Why were you so bad on your appearance? On... What? Well, I guess I... <laughs> Wait, yeah, that, was a... that was a good one, Mike? <laughs> that was a good one? He had a oh, point. This is sick. I'm sick to my stomach now. now. You get FMU, you're on the air. Hello? Hello, you better be... Can you hear this guy, Marty? Oh, I can. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, Martin. How are you? I'm good. My name's Drennan. How are you? Good. Um, I am a big fan of uh, Clifford as well. I think it's awesome that uh, uh, Tom spearheaded this uh, Clifford thing. It's cool. Uh, Captain Ron, though, how great is that movie? <laughs> well, you see, this is a... look. I don't know what that guy is. He's uh, look. This is what is, what is, what's going on here, Mike? You're on probation. No more calls. <laughs> Only internet questions where I can screen them politely. Somebody wants to know about the Queen haters. On I love the Queen haters. That was yeah. That was uh, appeared on SCTV on Mel's Rock Pile. That's right. And now what, uh, did, 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 look, I, I, I don't know if you're the uh, world's biggest uh, punk fan, but there are all these people at, uh, at this radio station. There's like a free-form station where there's talk shows and there's music shows. There's a lot of shows that play kind of like punk and uh, crazy rock. And the Queen Haters gets played on the air by people because it just... That is, that, like, what was, what, I'm gonna, what was your process for that? Like, did you... Did you just find a band to record that, or I mean? No, no, no. We recorded it. It was, uh, but uh, I would just watch 
the Sex Pistols, and uh, it was supposed to be a real cheesy uh, kind of band, like the guy from Wisconsin would like. And um, and John Candy went and committed to a bald pate. I remember that. Yeah, that's what that that dead eyed stare. <laughs> yeah, over, with a little uh, uh, with the little glasses. Yeah, with a little chain. Mm-hmm. That um, because you your your inflection in that song is just like you are so off the song, but right on it. Also, <laughs> it's just uh. It does. It. You you could have had a career as a, uh, you know, fronting an actual band. Yeah, but you couldn't do two shows in a row because I remember you bl- you blow your pipes out in one song. Yeah, yeah. I hate the bloody claim, you know all that stuff. Now, uh, now Jiminy Glick was you did how many seasons of that did you do for Comedy Central? Uh, we did three. And there's a uh, there's a best of DVD, but people I'm there's a couple of people who've written now and they say they want to know about is there any plans for anything. A little more substantial. Of the um, then, then, th- we, well, you know, you know, you t- you let these characters go to the, um, you know, the rest home for a while, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, then then you can bring them back or not. Yeah, I mean, I mean Jiminy, Jim, Jiminy's in the pasture somewhere. Yeah, I mean, just in terms, oh, no, he'll of, be showing up and re- he'll be showing up at the Count Basie Theater. Don't mm-hmm. get me wrong. But just in terms of, uh, is there like a DVD? Like a like a full season package, I think is what they were they were wondering. Oh, I see, I yeah. see. Um, a full season package. I don't think there is. I think there's a best of of the uh, of season one kind of thing. Yeah. And there's a best of season two and best of season three. Now, Mike, you know how many strikes there are in baseball, right? <laughs> there are. You've. They, hey. Don't be frightened of a jerk. What is this, Moscow in the fifties? <laughs> Let them on. All right. Number three. Okay. I run a tight ship here, Marty. All right. FMU, you're on the air. Hi, Tom. This is Spoonie in Brooklyn. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. This is, I know this guy's okay. Uh, you're, <laughs> on, you're on with uh, Martin Short. Hello, Mr. Yeah. Martin Short. How are you? Hello. How are you? Hi. I have a question for you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a really big fan of your work, and I just want to say that, that the joy that you throw into all of your roles is, uh, is, is very infectious. And that's, it just always makes it um, fun to watch everything you do. But my question is, is you never tried to do that thing that a lot of your peers have done where they went into super dramatic acting. Or they, hey, assassin. It, to me, sometimes it seems like they overcompensate by taking these, like, serial killer roles or very creepy roles. And that's something you've yeah. never done. I, I don't know. I think it's, I think it, I, I, I kind of think, you know, um, if you're doing a character that you are acting. So I, I've never felt really un, anything unrequited about, um, oh, if I could only cry. Um, uh, I, I think it's actually harder to try to figure out how to keep a bizarre reality while at the same time uh, being sincere and at the same time being funny. So I don't know. I also think everyone makes a contract with you. You know, like I can sing. But if I went out on Letterman and just sang um, a medley of songs that weren't nominated... I think that people would be waiting for a sandbag, and if it didn't fall, they'd they'd wish it had. Uh, you know. <laughs> Which I I want to I want to clarify by with my question is and say that that Clifford the character Clifford isn't terrifying in himself. <laughs> See, yeah. you don't need to go more terrifying than Clifford. Yeah, like whenever whenever I watch that movie, I am filled with this with this urge to like appease this child anyway because my life is probably in danger. Or take a silver bullet. Yeah, <laughs> and end it all. Well, All thank, right. Thank, thank you, you very you. much. Thank you. Thank right. you. So, uh, let me take. We have another good one here. Apparently, FMU, you're on the air. Hello. Hello. Hello, <laughs> Martin. Yes, I, I do have a question. Okay. Is this one of your well, characters? That, that, that any time would be good. Okay. Um, there was a movie you did many years ago. And I can't think of the name of it. It was with Kevin Bacon, and he played uh, the big a, a, a up and coming writer. Yes, it's called The Big Picture. The Big Picture, Picture. Yes, okay. Correct. I couldn't remember the name of it because um, a friend of mine had it on um, VHS, and I couldn't remember the name of it. If only there was some system where we could track down movie titles. Oh, yeah, yeah that's true. Well, do you have a question about it, or did you just want him to you name the, the movie? name of it. You know, <laughs> Google could have done it. I figured this out, too, you know. Uh, no, I, I just... Um, I, 
just haven't seen it in years prior to that. So I just wonder whether it was on DVD or. Yeah, I can't. I think it actually. I think it is on DVD. I gotta say, Mister. I'm gonna call you Mister Short now. These callers, yeah. <laughs> this is, they get an F tonight. These callers get an F. Usually, well, you should see the calls they get. This one wants to say this to me. That one wants to say that. I announce we get a high-powered star on the thing. I don't know. No, what the, no, what, no. I think. Well, I think that you've got to. He may. He. I'm sure he had a point. Yes. It couldn't have been just about the title. But I the film is a big been. picture, directed by Kevin uh, Christopher uh, uh, Guest. Yeah, and that's a that's a great movie too. And that you you also you know you're talking about how you play Jiminy Glick as a you know a power a guy with you know unearned power. Yeah, you've also like like a Nathan Thurm character or the agent in Big Picture. It's like it seems like you take pleasure in that kind of that kind of just guy who's about to his head's about to explode. With, with well, Nathan, Nathan Thurm was a guy who just I that was kind of inspired by Nixon because, or it could have been Bush, but anyone who just looks in the camera and lies, uh-huh. I find hilarious. Yeah, and especially with Nixon because as he was lying, and saying I don't know where the eighteen minutes went, there'd be sweat on the top of his lips. So we knew he was lying. He knew we knew he was lying. But he just stared in the camera and lied and, and dug in. And then what Nathan Thurm would do is when really cornered, lash out. Mm-hmm. And again, that was more Cheney. Mm-hmm. And, and that cigarette ash you had going, how did, how did you manage to get that, that ash? Well, a little, it, it, just to put a little wire in it <laughs> is that, so oh, that, that the ash would stay on it. Oh, that, that, is, uh, that is fantastic because it's just like when you're home watching that, you just feel it's just like all you can stare at. Is that growing <laughs> ash? We have uh, Martin Short on the show. Uh, you can uh, go down uh, this Saturday. Oh, look, I'm going to say this. I, I I hope that there's a line of people can't wait to get into the show. Some of these callers, I don't want them in that theater. <laughs> no, you're being too hard on your audience. This, by the way, this is your audience. These are my people. You know what? They're not. They're not pointing up Mike Wallace. No, no, they're no. you. These are my people, and this is your gonna, people. I'm going to go home and s- stare at a wall tonight. No, that's, but that's look. I mean, it, it's you should be proud of your audience. Number four, Mike. <laughs> FMU, you're on the air. Oh, hi, Tom. Hi, Mr. Short. Uh, this is how Ryan are you, from Manhattan? Who is this? Hi, this is Ryan hi. from Manhattan. Hi, Ryan. Hello. Hi. Um, um, uh, thank you for taking my call. Um, my pleasure. I, um, I. Entered the interview midway through, so I apologize if you've addressed this already. But um, you made the transition from SETV to SNL. Um, I was just wondering if, if did you find that a big shift, or was there any difference at all in terms of you know work ethic, or in terms of just working on a sketch? Well, the whole concept of you know SETV was kind of ideal because you're working in your hometown, which was Toronto, for me. Mm-hmm. And you would write for six weeks, and then you'd shoot for six weeks, and while you were shooting, you would edit and then they'd assemble the show, and and Saturday Night Live is more of a rush, you know. It's but it's also more daunting. I mean, you you can have a hit show on Saturday, you can feel great, you go to the party, you feel cool, and then by Sunday morning you'd get congratulatory calls, and then you may go to a hip hip lunch, and then by Sunday night though you start to get that thing in your stomach because you don't have any ideas, and then if you were a writer on the show and performer as I was, you would go into the Monday meeting and you'd let's say it's I don't know Ringo or something and you'd fake your way through the meeting hi and you'd fake your way through ideas that you didn't have and then by Monday night if you didn't have anything you felt like the biggest failure in the world and yet 48 hours before you were um, Mr. Television so that thing never happened in SCTV um, and uh, so that process was obviously different it was like final exams every week but then the kind of surge of of being successful on live television is uh, can't be replaced. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. Finally, someone. See, you're happy now, Tom. I'm in a. I'm happier. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> so. Um, let me see. Is good. Is three good? Uh, no, this one I oh, two. FMU, you're on the air. Hey, Tom. Hey, Mr. Short. It's Mike Manhattan. How are you, How are you doing? Beautiful. Very good, very good. How are you tonight? I'm good. 
I just wanted to uh, pay a compliment to you in, in a sort of a, a weird anecdote. Just uh, I, uh, I play in a band of a heavier, a heavier sound, a punk band, if you will. And uh, when we talk up the songs, uh, some of the songs are uh, kind of serious and political. And then for our last song, we don't we don't even bother with uh, with 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 basically talk. We just ask the crowd what their favorite line from Clifford is. <laughs> and and believe it or not, it gets uh, it gets like a big response. And I'll just pass the microphone around to you know whoever has one. And a lot of people have one. And at the end of the show, nobody will come up to us without mentioning how much they like the movie Clifford. Well, thank you, man. That's very nice. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's great. It's great. Anyway, take care. Okay. See, it is growing. This Clifford thing. There needs to be a better DVD of Clifford out there, not one that's just in the uh, full frame. It's like it's like watching the the thing on on uh, you know on on TV. It's just the yeah. You want you want the whole wide screen. You want like how the West was won. <laughs> exactly. I want yeah. to be able to see. Look. Yeah. Exodus. I'm, Right. Exactly. It's not. I know this is not exactly uh, the Ten Commandments. <laughs> no, no, it really was. wasn't. No. no, there really wasn't. The budget was less. But that's the, that's the awesome part of it. When it's just because there's this kid who's ten, but you're making him say these things that uh, maybe a child of the '40s would have, like calling people <laughs> pa- pappy, like using pappy, and he's a good. You seem like a good enough sort, and. <laughs> Like these phrases that no kid in the 90s would ever use. So it's, yeah. the creation is just, there's nothing like that. Well, thank you. And when you went into it, looking at it from that point, you were, just, were you just making him just this amalgam of all kinds, like every type of bad kid there has ever been? Yeah, there'd been a movie called The Bad Seed with sure. Patty McCormick, and... Um, that was a big inspiration of that because uh, she was so icy cold and would say things like who i like that who i remember thinking that's so strange <laughs> because, and uh another another thing with the character is just like you get this underbelly of him that you just you just are figuring out like he doesn't sleep a lot like you're just realizing like a kid you know kids sleep like nobody's business but this kid is up you know, he's sleeping like four hours. And yeah, he, if that, and yeah. and mainly a diet of sugar. Yes, <laughs> like yes, it just. So it almost the character begs more. You you want to know more about him, but you just you're piecing these little fragments together, and you get to see his home life with his mom who drinks a little bit too much, and the father who uh, is clearly going to have a stroke soon. <laughs> exactly, and when you do that thing with the mouth, at the. <laughs> For the stroke, that is, I've never seen anything funnier than that. Well, thank you. Now here's a, here's a question somebody asked: Who in your in your career, who who was another comedian that you have felt the best kind of back and forth with or rapport with? Oh, I'd say Catherine O'Hara. I'd say Andrew Martin. All the SCTV people. Mm-hmm. I definitely uh, Steve Martin. Uh, I would say. Uh, I'd say Christopher Guest is a pretty genius man and mm-hmm. very, very funny. Mm-hmm. Now, is there is there another? We're going to let uh, uh, Mr. Short go. He's got a busy <laughs> night. He's, fl- he's he's tired from flying. Yes. Is there another? Is there a good final call here, Mike? Two. This is for all the marbles now, Mike. <laughs> I think Mike's done a great job. And I, I, you know, this, this, uh, we, we've got to be open to the barbs and arrows of, of outrageous subjects. Well, this is what I, first of all, now all he's going to do is say, yeah, all he's going to say is, Mar- Martin Short said I did a good job, I'm doing a good job. You're not allowed to call him Marty. Just, can you please <laughs> say for me, Marty, that you say, Mike, you're not allowed to call me Marty. If Mike, you-, you are allowed to call me Marty. Oh. You see? Oh, I love Mike. Come on. <laughs> no, I don't like this. Let me, let's go to line two. FMU, you're on the air. Hi, Tom. Hi, Mr. Short. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. 
Uh, I'm a huge fan. Um, this is Erica from Baltimore, by the way. Um, well, I'm a more huge, than just huge, Erica. fan. <laughs> you're Erica. Um, and uh, I was actually thinking of one of my favorite movies when I was younger, which was Inner Space. Oh, I um, like that movie. Yeah. Yeah. Was that, yeah. I'm sure that was a lot of fun to make, but was it? I guess it was like your first sci-fi movie, and I was wondering if you kind of had a sci-fi experience. Like, I don't know if they had Comic Con back there back then. No, or. it was um, it was just I, Steven Spielberg produced that movie, and Meg Ryan, I think, it was one of her first movies. And Dennis and Meg kind of fell in love in that movie. It was it was it was uh, uh, directed by Joe Dante. It was a, a really good script, and. Um, no, it's fun. We had fun. We all, all the actors bonded. We had we shot in San Francisco for a couple of months. That was a good time. I mean, that's the thing. When you make a movie, it doesn't really matter how it turns out. And it certainly doesn't matter uh, if someone likes it. Believe me, for everyone uh, who uh, has said they like Clifford, there are, are scores of people who say that is maybe the worst film ever. <laughs> and uh, I, once, uh, I once commented uh, mistakenly, about a film I'd made and said, they, somebody said, what's the, what's the film you'd made you didn't like? And I mentioned it, and then this 14-year-old kid came up to me and said, dude, you said that film, I love that film, you made me feel bad. And I said, oh, God, you can never say that. That's right. Because all comedy, obviously, is subjective. So what one person loves, another person hates, and no one's wrong and no one's right. So um, the, as an actor in a movie, the one thing that can, you, you keep is just having fun doing it. Because you have no idea if the director's going to screw it up or if anyone's going to like it or they're going to like it ten years later. But you can control um, what you, the experience you have doing it and if it's fun. And that's why stage is fun, because you're in complete control. Well, well, that's great. And I've, I've always been, been a big fan. Every time I hear My Little Buttercup, I think of Ned from Three Amigos. So. <laughs> Thanks. Well, thank you, Erica. See, and that's how we go out with the calls. Well, you can't, Tom. You can't top that. No, I can't. That's I, I, I imparted wisdom. Erica was sexy. It was perfect. One, one question from the internet here. Somebody wants to know. They, they've written ten times here. They want to know about. You did your HBO special. I Martin Short goes Hollywood. That's right. Will we ever see that in any form where where it is it is uh, viewable? I think you can get that on DVD. I, I don't scour. Uh, I'm not like, you know, the character from Sunset Boulevard sitting late at night going <laughs> through the internet. Damn it. Well, I can't I find it, but I, I, I've been told that you can get that. Okay. That was, you yeah. know. And now, now uh, a final question that uh, people have asked all night is, uh, like, what, what, uh, what can we look forward to? You have the live show, which, which you do pretty regularly throughout the country. Yes. Is there anything else up your sleeve? Uh, can... I am uh, I am writing this uh, movie that I'm uh, hopefully going to uh, maybe direct next year, called Off Your Meds, and I'm going to uh, tour Australia and Europe with my shows uh, for the next few months, and uh, that's what I'm doing. Oh, that is fantastic! Well, hey, look, I I uh, I cannot tell you how much this meant to me for you to call up and uh, spend some time with us here on the show. Hey, pleasure, Tom. I had a riot, and, uh, of course, Andy Breckman, uh, you know, I'll do anything for him. Well, thank you. I, I'm going to thank him also for this. <laughs> and uh, please, I, everybody should go see uh, If I'd Saved, I Wouldn't Be Here uh, this Saturday night, May 2nd, at the uh, Count Basie Theater in Red Bank. And uh, you can get tickets and information at countbasietheater.org. Even the weirdos who called tonight, they, I'm going to allow them to buy a ticket. <laughs> hey, I love everyone. That is That's true. me. Well, yeah. Well, thank you again for calling. All right, Tom. Uh, my pleasure. Okay. Thanks, man. Right, bye. bye. See that, Mike? See what that just was? Guy's a god! And he was on the show! Oh, boy. Has there ever been a, Is that the nicest guy ever? He did say nice things about you. That's the only thing he got wrong. Oh, I don't get that. That just shows he's too nice. That just shows he's too nice. Look, if you give him five minutes with Mike, he'll be singing a different tune there. Oh, boy. The Best Show is produced in partnership with the Forever Dog Podcast Network. The show is hosted by Tom Sharpling and features John Worcester, Michael Lisk, Jason Gore, and Pat Burke. 
The show is produced and written by Jason Gore, Pat Byrne, Michael Lisk, Brett Davis, John Worcester, and Tom Sharpling. The Best Show is executive produced by Tom Sharpling, Brett Boehm, Joe Cilio, and Alex Ramsey. Co-executive produced by Jason Gore and Pat Burns. Segment producer, Michael Lisk. The show is engineered and mastered by Andrew Gleason and Wesley Knapp. Graphic design, video editing, and social media by Brett Davis. Website and technical support by Martin Sellis. And the show is recorded at Forever Dog Studios in Los Angeles. Support The Best Show on Patreon over at patreon.com slash the best show and follow us on youtube twitter instagram and tiktok at best show for life that's best show number four life thanks for listening and we'll see you next week